It is just a huge, huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Jose Luis Ruiz all the way from Studio City, California. He's actually in his home right now in Hollywood Hills. Now, those are all suburbs of Los Angeles, you said? That is correct. That is correct. You know, it's funny. When you are when you grow up in Kansas and you learn geography, they tell you California has three cities, San Diego, L.A., and San Fran. And then you never meet <laughs> anyone the rest of your life from California that lives in those three towns. They always live in another town. Dr. Ruiz is the director of the Los Angeles Institute of Clinical Dentistry and course director of numerous CE courses at University of Southern California, USC. He is honorary clinical professor at Warwick University in England and member of the editorial board for Dentistry Today. He is also an associate instructor at Dr. Gordon Christian PCC in Utah and independent evaluator of dental products for CR, formerly known as CRA. Dr. Ruiz was named as one of the leaders in CE every year from 2006 to 2018 by Dentistry Today. He has published several research papers as well as many clinical articles on adhesive dentistry, occlusion, aesthetic dentistry. He regularly lectures at all major dental meetings nationally and internationally. It's just a huge honor to have you uh, come on the show today. You know, It is my honor, Howard. It is my honor. Uh, thanks, buddy. Um, you know, you always talk about super gingival, minimally invasive adhesive dentistry. What does that mean? And, and I want to preface one thing before you start is that old guys like me who are 55 and I have, you know, three grandchildren walking and two of two uh, grandchildren in the oven right now that'll be out this year. Um, but people my age don't listen to podcasts. I always tell my homies, email me Howard at dentaltown.com. Tell me your name, what country you're from, how old you are. And it's like once a month, someone's my age. They're all 30 and under. So a 25% are in dental school, the rest are under 30. They're, they just got out of dental kindergarten. So what did super gingival, minimally invasive adhesive dentistry, what, what does that mean to you and why are you so passionate about it? Well, that means a, a, a way to treat patients in a much more healthy, minimally invasive way. Uh, um, you know that, that every time we put a margin, a restorative margin below the gum, we cause inflammation. And uh, in, in this book, which you know, uh, recently widely published, called Exactly Super Gingival Millimeter Basic Dentistry, uh, and in this book, we talk about that. We talk about all the research that, that is in the literature, and it's been around for, for decades, showing that every time we put a margin below the gum, there will be inflammation. Uh, I, I see patients who have uh, the teeth crowned, and, and, and almost I would say easy, 90%, maybe more of, of all the teeth that I see with crowns, the gums are puffy around them because they always have some gingival margins. And, uh, and of course, fillings are also the same way. If it's done with a traditional approach, uh, breaking contacts, dropping cervical margins, it's unhealthy for the patients. And, and uh, you know, Three, four years ago, maybe a little bit more than that, I published a, an article with, with Gordon Christensen in which we talk about how, uh, it's a, it's, it, we call it the myths versus reality article in restorative dentistry. And uh, in that article, we, we talked about how uh, a lot of, uh, most, most of our colleagues think that traditional crowns and traditional mechanically retained uh, restorations are easier and better and more durable which in fact, they're not. So, so really, uh, super gingival dentistry is a really, really extensive um, uh, approach. It's a change of, of doing dentistry. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, I personally haven't cut a tooth for a crown in 15 years. So I, I don't really, um, the, in this book, we kind of talk about this, that how cutting crowns is, is something that, that is no longer necessary. These kids, they get out of school and they, you know, um, they need to go learn uh, their basics. They need to go get, you know, a thousand MOD composites under the belt, a thousand single crowns. So they're all going to go work as an associate somewhere in, in a DSO or private practice. And they're, the first thing the, their office manager is going to tell them is that the insurance isn't going to pay for an inlay or an onlay. So you got to do a crown. What would you say to that 30 year old? Uh, Dennis, when she wants to do this fancy inlay onlay, and the DSO she works for says, "No, it's it's got to be a crown or a direct filling." What what do you say? Well, the first thing is I, I would say that 
Inlays, I, I don't do inlays. I don't believe the indirect inlays have any benefits over uh, a direct composite. So I, I certainly encourage them to, to do direct composites in the most minimally invasive way using super gingival techniques. And direct composite is phenomenal, but, but the key is doing it in an efficient way. So, so I would say be really good at doing class twos, class ones, class threes. Learn, you know, a more minimally invasive approach. And and, and our book, the Super Gingival Minimally Invasive Industry book, talks about very, very uh, different ways to prep. Um, now, in regards to full crowns not being covered, I mean, onlays not being covered by, by insurance, I, I would disagree with that. I mean, I think it's, it's just the same myth as... as um, you know, thinking the crowns are better than, than bonded uh, onlays. Um, the same myth is like insurance don't cover it. No, in fact, they do. I, I tell you, I've been doing it. And that's the only thing I do, and insurance always pay. Now, there's there's caveats to that. You know, depending how many surfaces. I, I you know, uh, if I'm going to do an onlay, it's going to be a tooth that is pretty beat up. It's a tooth that, that, would, that, that most people would cut a crown on. Otherwise, I'm going to do a direct restoration. And uh, so, so the insurance is going to pay for a crown. It's going to pay for an onlay, an alternative onlay, which, you know, um, and, and maybe some insurances pay a little bit less for an onlay, but not a lot, you know, a few, a few dollars. Um, with proper techniques, prepping an onlay, cementing an onlay, is even faster than doing a traditional crown. No cord packing, no retaking impressions, uh, uh, you know, all, lots of benefits. In fact, uh, what I would say to all those young dentists is, please look into it because what you realize and, and what I've seen with, with, with the, the, the over 1,500 dentists that have gone through my workshops is the people that have taken these courses and they learn to do super gingival, uh, partial coverage, onlays, veneers, even fillings, they always tell me, my goodness, this makes dentistry a lot easier and faster. So uh, so I think it's an excuse, to be honest with you, Howard. When you talk to, about a direct inlay, um, you're, you're not a fan of direct inlays and that uh, you would rather just do a direct composite. Is that because to get the draw of the inlay to draw in and out, you have to re it's not, it's less minimally invasive. You have to remove two structure just for the draw is that is that why that is absolutely why I, that is absolutely why well that's one of the reasons and let me tell you something just recently not too long ago i happened to go to uh uh, uh one of those really well-known schools uh and and to, to take a course on Sarek. and uh i don't want to say names but it was probably uh, spear uh, what they were what they were teaching there is they were teaching you know a very well known person was saying that that class two composites are very difficult to do and very unpredictable. So he was saying, look, you guys have a Seric, use the Seric, do a class two with your Seric. It's a lot better. It's a lot. It's really. It's almost as fast. And and I'm thinking this is crazy. But then at the break, I was talking to all the guys and, and girls there, and they were all saying, oh, my goodness, this sounds great. I think that's a great idea, which clearly shows the, the class two, direct class twos are complicated for most people, and it shouldn't be. But uh, as you said, the disadvantage of uh, um, a seric inlay or, a, or an indirect inlay is that we cut the heck out of the tooth compared to a minimally basic preparation that we can do a tiny, tiny little hole, re just remove the caries and repair it and patch it, which research shows, and I, you know, in the book we show this research, uh, uh, research shows that a direct restoration, a small direct restoration will, will outperform an indirect restoration. Now, large composites do la have less longevity, but smaller, Direct restorations are incredibly durable, especially if your margins are in enamel. So um, the bottom line is is is, is 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 better, healthier, faster when it's properly done. A direct composite is always going to perform uh, this aggressive inlay. Well, you know, um, I'm glad you brought up Sarah because one of the questions she always says is, 
Um, look, Doc, I graduated two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt, and I'm starting up my practice. This is true. Um, this is true. Do I really need to buy a hundred and fifty thousand dollar CAD CAM Cirac machine or an E4D to be a good dentist like you? That's a very good. That's a very good question, Howard. And and I asked not too long ago. I published an article on Dentistry Today talking about that. And I've I've had a CAD CAM. You know, I had an E4D. I had a couple of Cirex. I currently have a CEREC, and to be honest with you, I, I, I can tell you that people can do better dentistry without it. Um, and, and that's kind of a tough statement. I, I, people, a lot of people hate me when I say those things, you know, but you may know that very well. There's some people don't like my comments, but the reality is I've, been, I've done a lot of CEREC's, lots and lots, thousands of CEREC's. The reality is that, that um, uh, it's a technology that, that makes a dentist, especially a new dentist, that is, 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 is prepping and taking impressions, and all of that is already difficult. And then it adds to their, to their, you know, to their job being a lab technician, maybe a digital lab technician, but a lab technician. Now you have to design, you have to finish, you have to do all these different things which a lot of people are not very good at. So what I see coming out of Cerex is a lot of pretty poor restorations because it requires, it requires you know, the ability to design well. Now the machines are getting better, and no question about it, they're getting better, uh, and, and, um, and it, can, it can be pretty, pretty good. But a laboratory technician is always gonna make a nicer restoration than, than uh, a, a, a CEREC restoration. So I'm sorry to sound a little bit down on it. I, I, I think it's a wonderful te te technology. I think CATCAM is amazing, but I think it's better in the hands of labs. I would say, you know, and again, people might not like this, but I would say, uh, especially young dentists are better off not getting into that because it just makes their life more difficult. Uh, with experience, with, with practice, after a while, why not? It's a nice extra little service to provide your patients. Well, you know, I, I want to tell the young kids out there that, um, you know, I call this dentistry and says, this is what I want to say. Would you rather have someone being politically correct and playing you and telling you what you want to hear? I don't like that. I'd rather have some guy tell me something I don't want to hear because that makes me trust you more. And there's too much politically correctness and lectures and journals and all that stuff. And I love it when um, people can come up and say to a billion dollar company, Dents by Serona, no, I, I, don't, I don't like your story. I mean, I own one, I don't like it. I mean, why do I want to scan and then, have, and then spend an hour milling out a crown when I'm not a lab man, when I can take an impression, send it, literally a mile down the street to a man who's made 10,000 crowns and then and temporize that tooth and just you know five ten minutes set them on their way two weeks later and then, and then use that chair to do another crown or another root canal or another see another patient i mean i i just see it slowing down i i see you know they always say that you know you get a stack machine you can numb prep scan make the whole crown in an hour but when you're out there in the field and you're talking to dentists, how long does it take? No, no, no. I, you're, you're correct. I'm totally in agreement. Uh, I, I'm very fast. As a t I mean, I've done thousands. So I'm very fast. And, and, and with even doing things as fast as possible, if I can, if I can do an onlay with a CEREC in an hour and 30, 45 minutes, I'm, I'm lucky. You know, just, you know, the day before yesterday, I did one, and it took me two hours. And I was like rushing, rushing, rushing. And trust me, when I prep an onlay, it takes me, you know, I numb up, I, I prep, and I, you know, take an impression and then let my assistant make a temp. I probably am out the door, out, out the, the operator in 15 minutes. And uh, and I, I kind of like that, you know. I, you know, it's quick. I'm out, the, I'm out of the room. My assistant makes the temp. Once I make the tem, I go back, I touch it to make sure it's legal, and then, uh, and then the, 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 you know, I see the patient two weeks later, the only fits like a glove, and I, I cement it in a few minutes as well. So, so uh, 
with supra gingival margins there's no bleeding so I, I don't have to suffer through isolation so so that, that is a lot easier than than like you said very well scanning and doing all these complicated things again I'm not against the technology I think it has it's amazing stuff and 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 it's a nice extra thing that that I offer to my patients and it's you know it's kind of like a selling point oh if you want we could do a same day I prefer when they say oh no I'd rather come back but uh <laughs> but but you know there it is okay so you can buy your book on amazon.com super gingival minimally invasive dentistry a healthier approach to aesthetic restorations by Jose Luis Ruiz uh, first edition. Um, it's an amazing book. Everyone I know uh, who's read it has uh, they've loved it. Um, that's uh, amazing. So, if my homies buy your book, um, tell us about your book. What are they going to learn? And congratulations, getting published by Wiley Blackwell. That's no easy feat at all. But what what are they going to learn if Thanks. they buy your book? So, well, a little bit about my book. You know, first of all, it, it, I, I'm, I'm honored that, that Dr. Raver Talati, who you know is, is the founding father of Ahitian, one of the most brilliant dentists, uh, he is the editor. He's a contributing editor on the book. So he kind of, you know, we, we work together very hard, making sure that the, the, the scientific principles are, are, are really complete. We have contributions from dentists, some of the best researchers around the world, uh, Gordon Christensen did the foreword on the book, so this is a solid, solid book. And you're right, it's been selling very well. Wiley's very happy there. They're already in talks to start translating into other languages. So it's very, it's a very, very successful book. Um, it really, the, the, it starts by making a point out of the fact that with all the advances that we have with uh, materials and techniques, the, the patient experience and the dental experience, the dentist experience has not really changed that much in the past 30 years in, in, in general, because most patients still go to a dentist. If they have a badly broken tooth, they're going to have a tooth cut for a crown and, and, and the tooth is going to be cut 75% based on research. The margins likely will be put below the gum and, and even part of most of the, 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 the periphery of the crown, the patient will have a lot of pain during the provisional stage. The, the, the impression, the, 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 te the technique is gonna be very difficult, the whole core technique, the preparation is difficult, uh, uh, the provisional, then, then when the patient comes back, a couple, you know, cementing a crown when you have bleeding gums is a complicated thing and, and we, and also, we showed literature showing and proving that the root canals are on the are on the rise. There's more root canals now than before, which means that, that whatever we're doing is 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 not is hurting the pulp. And and we show in the book the research uh, talking about how every time we cut a tooth seventy five percent, the nerve is not going to like that. Then the book continues to talk about the fact that that there's reasons why we the profession you know, thinks that this is the, 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 the best way to go. And um, I published extensively on that in the past, and the book has some of those uh, articles, but it also has articles from a number of other people who also agree with the fact that, that there are some myths in, in the way we, we treat, you know, we, the, the reasons why we feel that we have to cut a crown. So after we explain that, we go through that on the book, then, then, we, then we turn into chapter two when we start talking about uh, what if we were to do uh, uh, something different? What if we were to, instead of, if a tooth is badly broken down, what if instead of, of um, cutting more, you know, if, if you have a patient that half of the tooth is missing because of caries or because of a fracture, why don't we preserve that leftover tooth and keep the margins above the gum and use advanced adhesion techniques versus you know, you have half of the tooth missing and then you cut 75% more away. It's like, how, how, count, how counterintuitive that is. Um, and then we, then, then, um, then we talk about, the, then the book in chapter two, three starts talking about uh, the, the, the principles of how to do this. You know, the, what we call the super gingival rules and techniques. And, and it goes through the five principles, which is, you know, first is judicious, 
a, a removal of tooth. Respect tooth structure, respect biology. Don't cut away unnecessary tooth that is healthy. Don't cut healthy tooth, basically, you know? Whatever is left, use a number of different techniques that we present to minimize the need to cut tooth away. So uh, then, then, then uh, the, the second rule of supergenerative dentistry is no need for mechanical retention. Resistance and retention form is history when it comes to adhesive dentistry. And a lot of people don't like me when I say that, and, uh, but, there, that, but if you talk to my, my good friend, Dr. Ray Bertolotti, he's going to tell you it's not only history, it's undesirable when you do adhesive restorations. So, so uh, every time we put uh, you know, ferrules, every time we do boxes, every time we do those things, axial walls, we actually make adhesive dentistry more destructive and, and less successful. Then, uh, then we go into some techniques that simplify uh, this the ability to, to move away from crowns and, and, and big boxes for, for direct restoration of class twos and do smaller preparations using preserving enamel. There's a technique called, you know, technique called enamel preservation and reinforcement, super gingival enamel preservation and reinforcement. And, this technique allows us to preserve the enamel even if we have to undermine it, especially in the cervical area. And I research on this, I publish research on this. It's a very, very great technique that simplifies um, uh, restorative dentistry. And then, and then we talk about margin elevation. And then, of course, we talk about um, the fifth principle, very, very important, the ability to do a veneer and an onlay with super gingival margins and be able to, to blend the restoration with the tooth. Using materials, using cements, they allow us to create kind of like a contact lens effect. So we don't have to go hide the ugly margin below the gum. Zirconia requires that. Of course, PFM is super ugly. PFM will require that. But if we use the correct materials, you know, uh, and use the right cement and right margin preparation, then we can achieve some nice blending and we can leave the margin above the gum and it was still gonna look pretty. So then burying the gums be in margins below the gum becomes unnecessary. So I'm making a long story. That's, that's, you know, that's chapter, chapter three. And then, then we go on into, into the, the actual nitty gritty. I mean, the book goes into a lot of detail on how to prep uh, var variations, some preparations for onlays, variations, of preparations for veneers. It talks a little bit about smile design as well. And, and it, then, then cementation, materials, adhesive. This chapter four is, is adhesive dentistry, the state of the art in adhesive dentistry. Ray Bertolotti and I spend, I cannot even tell you how much time and how much articles we got into the cutting edge research, ask questions to the smartest people in dentistry around the world, and that, that chapter is actually something that we are very proud of. And then, uh, then also, towards the end of the book, we talk about occlusion. I, I, I talk about the three golden rules, uh, you know, how, how to manage occlusal disease, because success with restorative dentistry is, it cannot be achieved without understanding occlusion. And understanding the occlusal disease is the biggest enemy to the longevity of our restoration. And in a nutshell, <laughs> That is what the different the, the the whole spectrum that we cover on this book. Socrates said, um, "Hippocrates, the Hippocratic Oath, primum non serum, first do no harm." And what I am hearing you saying is the difference between a direct class two and, a, and an indirect inlay is that you remove all the decay, but now you're just taking out normal healthy tissue to fix your restoration. And you're saying you don't do crowns, full crowns, hardly um, much at all, because you just go back to that molar, remove everything that's not right, you remove all the disease, and then primum non serum, first do no harm, Hippocrates, the, why are you removing all of this healthy two structure? When, and, and when you're young, when you're under 30 and you haven't done a thousand crowns, if you, it, when when she comes out of school and does her first thousand crowns, twenty five years later, how many of those teeth would have died and need a root canal and a crown? How many of those 
root canal and crowns would have fractured and then another decade later end up being extracted and replaced with a bridge or an implant. I mean, if, if you're really going to, I mean, there's, so what you're doing is you really love minimally invasive and, and you just don't want to remove a bunch of tooth structure for no reason. Because I believe that that's what's best and I'm 100% sure that it's what's best for the tooth and the best for the patient. And, and, and over the way over 20 years that I've been doing this, I've seen in my practice, I almost never do a root canal after I do a non-layer of an ear. I mean, it's like unheard of when I have to do a root canal on one of those, um, uh, which is amazing. And then, then uh, you know, my hygienists, you know, they're always like, oh my goodness, I love that they don't have to be, the, the gums are always healthy. Patients, they, they stay healthier. They, they are in much better shape. And, um, and, and what makes it even better is it's better for the patient, but it's also when we learn these techniques, it's actually better for the dentist. That's something that is very important. It's easier, it's faster, it's more predictable, it has less problems. Traditional crown and bridge, even traditional direct restorations are complicated the way they're taught in dental school. You know, they're still, they're still being taught in the, the GB black techniques and boxes and, and dropping cervical margins and things that, that just make dentistry more difficult. Okay, so when you're playing high school football, I mean, you're trying to teach them four basic things, you know, a pass, a catch, a block, a tackle. And you don't want to go into high school and start teaching them these complicated flea flicker plays and all this crazy. So you're talking to 25% of these listeners right now, thousands of them around the world are in dental school. The other 75% are out in their first five years, they're under 30. And when you take 100 million insurance claims filed and you look at all the, the tooth numbers, it looks like just, you know, then big spike on the first four first molars. You know, three, 14, 19, 30. I mean, those four first molars are the teeth most likely to get an MOD composite, a crown, a root canal, everything. So I want to hold your feet for the fire. And I want you, because they're always telling me, well, he didn't say what, it, what technique he used or what adhesive or what brand or what he did. So I want you to walk him through an MOD composite, complete detail. She's got a patient, it's a first molar, it's got two interproximal lesions, she's gotta sit down and do an MOD, and I want you to talk exactly, brand, name, composite. Can you do that, just the total detail? Yes, of course, okay, of course, that. I'll be, and it doesn't, when, if, if I mention brands and, and names, it doesn't mean that this is the only material that would work, but it certainly is something that I'm currently using and I, I'm very successful with it. So, um, Well, actually, uh, I, I, the reason I like you to walk, like, talk brands because like Chicago Midwinter is coming up. How many different composite systems are going to be on sale? And she just doesn't have time. She's, she's looking at, um, do, do you, my, is it rude? Could I ask you how old you are? I'm 51. So how many years you been doing this? 25 years. Yeah, or yeah. Something so she's like there saying, "Okay, look, dude, I'm going to Chicago Midwinter. How many? How many different composite systems are, is going to be on sale there? What would you guess? A hundred? At, at least. So she's like, simplify my world. You've been doing this for a quarter of a century. I don't have time to go figure out a hundred different. Same thing with implants. I mean, the, uh, at the uh, Cologne meeting, at the last Cologne meeting, at the IDF meeting. Um, there were 600 implant systems for sale. So, so she wants to know your brand. Just walk her through it. It's, it's, a, it's a nice shortcut. So, so walk okay. her through. It's an MOD composite. So one of the first things, and, and what I want to share is I want to share a technique that, that makes it easier and faster because I, I, I believe that, that if the techniques are not easier and faster and more predictable, then, then what's, the, what's the benefit? So... So the first thing is, I, I, if I, whenever I do a class two, I, I, like, I want to put, use something that's called a fender wedge from Garrison. I stick it in, and the purpose why I do that is because I, I, is, is, it doesn't just protect the adjacent tooth. It makes me infinitely faster because I don't have to worry. I just go at it. I attack the cavity. I go in with my, with my 1556 from Brassler. I, I, you know, go through the, through the marginal ridge, knowing, knowing where the cavity is, 
and and sink it in about three millimeters and go out and and create and hit the I mean not intentionally but hit the the, the fender wedge to open up that proximal uh, 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 margin the proximal two millimeters. So I'm not I'm not creating a big wide box the traditional way. I make it very narrow. I'm still within the contact area, only two millimeters, you know. So I create a, a you know a, a tunnel shape preparation. Then drop that cervical floor. Make sure that the only the only thing that I'm looking for is I'm looking for removing the demineralized enamel. So I remove the demineralized enamel. You know it looks white. So you get you know you and at this point you have peripheries with a you know peripheries of enamel. You know the 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 tunnel shape preparation, and you're still gonna have caries in the denting, because as you know, it, it caries goes through the enamel in a very small hole, and then once it enters dented, it spreads. So so I create a, a, an outline, a tunnel shape outline, healthy enamel on the periphery, and now I start digging out the denting. What, what that's going to call it was it's going to create a, a a smaller external outline and a bigger internal outline. Uh, I don't want to have huge amounts of unsupported enamel, especially facial lingual clue, so it's not a need for that. So I might expand a little my external outline to 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 uh, you know if the cavity is relatively big. Cervically, on the other hand, I will leave the enamel margin on healthy enamel even if I undermine the dentin. So at the end, I will have a smaller external outline, a bigger internal outline on the preparation. No specific shape, you know. Uh, uh, so I will use caries indicator. I like to use the caries indicator from Carare, Carare and the, that's the name of the brand, caries indicator, and uh, uh, or detector, I think, it's caries detector from Carare. And, and it's, a, it's a stain the, the, it stains the decalcified uh, uh, dentin and, 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 and the infective dentin. And so, so uh, research from Fusayama and many others, Alaman and others have shown the benefits of using caries detector to, to remove the judicious amount of tooth. The old fashioned approach of removing Everything until you get to, to super hard dentin, super white and hard dentin is too aggressive, it's too destructive. And then there's plenty of literature showing that, that a more judicious way to remove caries is necessary and desirable to prevent uh, pulp exposures, to prevent getting even getting close to the pulp, to c cut less tooth, you know. So we're using caries detector properly, 10 seconds, you put the, the caries detector on the tooth for 10 seconds, then wash, dry, any super red, you know, dentin has to be removed. But as you start getting to the deeper, the, the, you know, layer of, of dentin, you start finding that this, the, it doesn't stain as red. Now it's just, it's just barely pinkish or even not stained at all. That can be preserved as long as we have a clean periphery. Then after we do that, then we will, um, then once we have nice clean cavity, now, now we can put a matrix band. Since, since we have had a wedge, uh, um, you know, a fender wedge, there's already, we have created separation. So usually you take your fender wedge out, you can put your matrix band in pretty easy because we already created can, separation. Can I stop you just for one second? Do you like the fender wedge mostly because it protects the adjacent tooth from your um, Brazzer 556? Or is that the main reason, or are there more than one reasons why you like the fender wedge? Oh, I, I, I mentioned the, 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 the other reason, which is probably the most important reason, is it makes me a lot faster. Okay, faster. Because, because I don't have to be, when, I'm, when I don't have the fender wedge and I'm prepping, I'm like very careful trying not to hit the adjacent tooth, and it takes oh, okay. me considerably longer. When I have a fender wedge, I go at it. You know, I attack the cavity, and it's way faster, okay. way faster. Okay. And um, so, so dual purpose. It's a great question. So then, once we, once I have a, a nice finished preparation, then matrix band 
wedge. The matrix band that I tend to use is the the uh, the one from Garrison and the and the ring as well. Um, so then I put my matrix, my ring, and uh, and then I, I will um, the the intention is for me is always to ice as soon as as I finish prepping, I isolate. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to allow saliva and other things to get on, on that preparation. I want to keep it clean. So, so immediately after preparation, isolation. I tend to use usually uh, cut and roll isolation. Once in a while, I use a dry shield, which is uh, you know kind of like a cheaper version of the isolizer, which works which works phenomenally well. Um, so, so but a you, lot of times so I just go for a, for a simple cut and roll isolate. Cut and roll, or uh, or the isolate is uh, um, substitute is dry shield. Right. Can, can the I? Dry shield is a cheaper version of the isolate. Okay, isolate. Okay, but I, I got I, my my job is to estimate their the viewers' questions, and I know she's wondering. Well, why would you use a Garrison sectional matrix system? as opposed to just a traditional Toffelmeyer style? Very good question. Um, it, the the Toffelmeyer matrix band tends to create very flat proximal contacts. And, uh, and a lot of times as you're squeezing the, the Toffelmeyer, it, it hugs the tooth and, and, you, and we end up not having very nice proximal contacts. The segmental matrix in the ring creates, and especially if we burnish it, it creates a much better contact. It creates a consistent, every time you get a nice contact. But it's important to put the matrix in and burnish it. So when you burnish that segmental matrix, it adheres a little bit with the adjacent tooth, and then you get really nice tight contact. So that's a really good question, and definitely a tougher mile matrix band doesn't work very good for the for composite. Uh, Tobelmeyer is used to work really good with amalgam because if you when you if you remember when we used to do amalgam we would pack the heck out of it. And amalgam is 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 thicker and you could pack it and push it so that so that co condensation allow that Tobelmeyer matrix band to shape itself and create a better contact. That doesn't happen to composite. Composite is not packable. So composite is going to take whatever shape the matrix has at the moment. So so definitely a segmental matrix will be a much more successful, much better interproximal contact. Currently the 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 the, uh, the person that knows the most about caries in the world is Dr. Rella Christensen. She's doing amazing research on caries. And um, and what she's finding is uh, uh, the, the, the caries, even a small caries bacteria travels almost all the way to the pulp. So, so killing the bacteria, maybe doing less aggressive preparations and killing the bacteria with something strong is something that I think is the future of, of dentistry. And certainly she's working on that. And, and, and I, I knowing Rella Christensen, I believe that she will give us better answers than what we're doing currently. But we remove the caries, at least the demineralized you know, caries, and then we get into the, to the, uh, uh, the effective dentin, as we said. It is very important to disinfect the cavity. So there's two ways to disinfect that cavity before we start filling. And one of them is using Gluma. Gluma is a wonderful disinfectant, 40 seconds, you apply it as glueraldehyde with HEMA, it disinfects the cavity pretty well in 40 seconds, then air dry it, get rid of the, the solvent, and then, then at that point we can start doing a filling procedure. Um, so so um, the, the, the way I do it now, I'm going to tell you what I do, I don't use Gluma. So what I use is I use a, a uh, bonding system called Clearfill SC Protect from Carrare. And what that bonding system has, it has a, a MDPB monomer, which is also a pretty powerful disinfectant. So it, it actually saves me the step of disinfecting the cavity because it's a disinfectant itself. So, so the next thing that I would do based on the type of bonding system that I use is the next thing that I would do is I would do selective etching of the 
enamel periphery for 10 seconds using phosphoric acid. I use, phosphor I use the phosphoric acid from Ultra then. I'm very careful to only etch the enamel, especially the external, out external outline of the enamel, the uncut enamel. I don't, I, I'm careful not to etch the dentin. And, it, and I know it requires a little technique, and but I don't want to etch the dentin because I don't I don't like total etch and I know total etch leads to sensitivity. So just 10 seconds of enamel etching, wash dry, then I apply the primer from Clear Fill IC Protect, which is a disinfectant, it's a primer, it etches because it's an acidic resin, so it does a lot of stuff for me. So I apply it for 25 seconds on the tooth, you know, agitating uh, uh, the, the, on the tooth, agitating on the dentin, then air dry to remove the solvent because these materials have a lot of solvent. And I will, I will blow air until the primer stops moving. So it doesn't matter how long it takes, it could take 10 seconds, it could take 15 seconds. I keep blowing a medium, a medium stream of air until that primer stops moving. That's when I know I got rid of the solvent. And getting rid of the solvent is very important for adhesive chemistry. Once I did that, then uh, then I apply the, the bond, which is the second component of the Carrara bonding system. Paint it, air thin it, because I want a very thin layer. It, it, both, both Carrara bonding systems, Clear Fluoro C bond, Clear Fluoro C protect, they're both thick bonds and they need to be thinned out a lot. Otherwise you end up with a, with a, with too thick of a bond layer. Thin it out, sap it with the light, and then we start doing the filling procedure. So the filling procedure requires that we understand the effects of polymerization shrinkage. So it is very important when we do the filling procedure to remember that that when you have when you bond to enamel and to dentin they behave very differently. When when you add and bond to enamel, you gain almost immediate high strength of adhesion. When you bond to dentin, that that bonding requires time because it's a different substrate. So you have immediate strong bond to enamel, weak bond to dentin. So so when you put a you know your flowable or your composite, if you put the flowable and composite in contact with bo both substrates and then you hit it with the light, it's going to shrink and it's going to pull towards the side that has the best bond. So you're going to have you know, the, the, the composite will separate or can separate from the, the, the adhesion to the dentin. If that happens, it leads to sensitivity and it could lead to open margins. So I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to explain something complicated into very simple words. So understanding that difference in, bond, in, in, in adhesion, then it should be very important that when, whenever we're filling the cavity, we are doing increments that segregate or separate dentin from enamel. So you do. So usually I do a layer of flobo over dentin, being careful not to touch enamel on that increment, sap it with the light, then an increment on enamel, the enamel periphery, you know, the, the cable margin basically, Sap it with the light, so we're segregating them, and then a next increment that make that puts them both together, and depending on the size of the cavity, it could be just one more increment that will fill all the way to the top, or if it's a larger one, it might require two increments, and and then uh, my final increment will be on the on the occlusal surface, which will on that occlusal surface I will develop the morphology before I hit it with the light. So um, after I do that, then 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 it just you know, remove the matrix band, remove the flash with a number twelve blade with a two-handed technique, so so we can trim the excess. I don't. I rarely even use any burrs on the you know to remove any excess, or actually never. 
I use the number 12 blade for everything. You know, the 12 blade is a beautiful instrument that trims the, the, the composite or the cement if I was doing an indirect restoration, trims it without having, without, you know, damaging the tooth, you know, during the process and, um, and take all the flash away. And then after that, I do a little occluso adjustment with a 12 fluted burr. Uh, and uh, then after that, I put an oxygen inhibitor. You know, we could use, we can buy it from the manufacturers. And Danville makes oxygen inhibitor. Other companies make oxygen inhibitors that we can put over the tooth. And then we can do final cure. You know, once we, we have the oxygen, we do final cure because that the 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 oxygen inhibitor layer will actually release chemicals that are unhealthy to the to to people. So by oxygen inhibiting and curing, we actually making healthier restorations and also stronger, more color, more color stable restorations. And, uh, and then the final thing is to do a nice occlusal adjustment. You know, um, use a two color paper technique, uh, tap tap on the blue, and uh, get get rid get make sure that we get equal contacts throughout the mouth. Of, you know. And then after we do the tap tap, then we check a lot of movements with the red paper, right, left, forward, and um, and then remove any red outside of blue, and that restoration should do amazingly well. That was amazing, and I'm so uh, honored to have you on because I'm sure so many of our listeners uh, never heard of a fender wedge from Garrison and it's protecting the adjacent tooth and it's making you go so much faster and probably most of them have never heard of using a 12 blade to remove all the excess flash that that was amazing but i already know what my homies major uh, problem is so i want you to talk about that they always say sensitivity so did your technique what part of the how much sensitivity you're getting and what part of your technique was evolved around preventing sensitivity because when I, I was just in AT still uh, last Sunday lecturing to uh, all the dental students and when I asked them what what is your number one problem with posterior direct composites they scream sensitivity uh, your one of your questions was do am, am I having problems with sensitivity and I can tell you I have zero problems with sensitivity I I count on the fact that when the patients go home the, the numbness wears out, they'll have zero sensitivity. Unless the cavity was almost in the nerve and then the patient would know that the nerve could be traumatized and we're like borderline, you know? But normal filling, normal onlay, normal veneer, zero sensitivity. And you, you think, so the question, how do I get that? Yeah, how, how, how did you get that? What, what? How, do we make, how do we minimize sensitivity? Well, there's two things, good adhesion and good occlusion. The first one that what you asked me, what part of the, the this procedure was had the, the intention of minimizing sensitivity. So so the the the, the first thing is um, disinfecting the cavity, you know, using either gluma or using a bonding system that has a disinfectant. Second and, of and all, you're, you're saying clear fill SC from Carrara okay. has that has a disinfectant in the, in the primer. So the primer has, is a monomer called MBPB and it, and, it, um, and it has a power of disinfectant plus it's an acidic resin that etches and primes at the same time. So um, um, the, the, the use of self etchers compared to total etch, not etching the dentin with phosphoric acid is a huge, huge, uh, 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 benefit to minimize the effect of, of sensitivity. So I haven't used a total edge. I haven't etched dentin in 15 years. So so I only self etch. And so so using a self etch is the other thing that I'm that I'm using do, doing to minimize the effect of sensitivity. And then use a meticulous bonding technique, which I pretty much explain. Uh, 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 you know, making sure that you get rid of the solvent. Uh, then, then uh, make sure that the you know you apply your bond, you thin it out, then you cure. Uh, the 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 other aspect of minimizing sensitivity is managing the effects of polymerization shrinkage, 
which I also mentioned. Uh, every time that we put up an increment of, especially the first couple of increments, if we mix dentin and enamel on the same increment, the composite shrinks, all composites shrink. They shrink and the composite will pull towards the enamel. You will create a gap in between the dentin and the, two, the, the, dentin and the, the bond and the, the composite, and that micro gap will lead to sensitivity. So managing the effects of polymerization shrinkage minimizes chances of sensitivity. So those are the, and of course, proper bite adjustment. Those steps will make sensitivity history. So now uh, the, um, that was just uh, poetry listening to you. I could listen to you for 40 days and 40 nights. So now I, I want, now I want to do the whole thing again for the second most common thing on the, again, we're focusing on first molars because that's where all the treatment is. And so now she's um, she graduated. She's working for her mom, who's a dentist. And whenever her so she has an MOD amalgam with recurrent decay. And for 40 years, her mom would just do that and prep a, a full crown and send it to the lab. And she'd do a you know she did a PFM for 20, 30 years. Now she's probably doing a full zirconia. Full zirconia. zirconia. So she. For two, three years out of school, she's just going to sit down, MOD amalgam, recurrent decay. She's going to prep the whole thing for a crown, pack a zero core to one core, take an impression. Is that what you would do? So talk us to a first molar, MOD amalgam, recurrent to crown. You're talking to a 30-year-old female dentist who just would do what her mama did. What would you do differently than her mama? So, so today... What I would do is a, a partial coverage onlay or full coverage onlay sometimes, meaning full occlusal coverage onlay. So, so um, the steps would be, would be, first of all, would be, of course, numbing up the patient. Second, you know, we would do, after the patient is numb, we take a pre-op impression. If we're gonna do a, 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 you know, a laboratory fabricated restoration, take a pre-op impression. Then, uh, then the preparation for an onlay is a piece of cake, really. Uh, we need to do an, a, a two millimeter reduction of the clusal. Uh, you know, of course, the middle of the tooth is probably, a lot of it is already missing because you have a big, large MOD with probably good amount of caries. So we do a, um, a, a, a two millimeter clusal reduction of the cusp, uh, the facial, the two facial cusps, then the lingual cusp. Then, uh, then after we do that using a, 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 a two millimeter diamond from Brassler, and I, to be honest with you, I don't remember the number at this particular moment, but a two millimeter reduction diamond. Then after after I do the occlusal reduction, then then it becomes a little bit easier for me to remove the caries because I have very better visibility. Um, my goal is going to be to to get rid of uh, the box shape of that amalgam and create more like a U-shape uh, uh, proximal area. So I will use that same diamond to, to, to get rid of the line angles, clean the caries as necessary and with a tremendous effort to not go below the gum. My goal is to stay super gingival. And, 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 and trust me, the great majority of the times it is possible and I have the same rotten teeth that everybody else does in, in my practice, you know. So, so uh, carefully atten attentive to that cervical margin, clean the caries, remove whatever the mineralized enamel we might have from that recurrent caries. And, and uh, once I have clean enamel, I will leave that and then I'll, I'll remove the caries using my caries indicators. And often what I'm gonna have is I'm gonna have again, just like with the class, the, the direct restoration, I'll have a little bit of a wall of enamel, of unsupported enamel uh, in the proximal cable margin in the cervical floor. I will undermine the, 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 you know, I will remove all the caries from the dentin and, uh, and once I use my caries indicator, indicator to remove all the caries, then 
if I have if I have a, a little wall of enamel and support enamel on the proximal area, I will etch bond, do my bonding procedure, and repair that. So so when I'm done, I'll have a a little repair in one maybe the mesial side of that MOD. I will have repair that, and then I will have an only preparation with with uh, everything super gingival. Um, I will you know instead of breaking contacts by dropping the margin, I will use a metal strip. If I still have a little contact, I will use a metal strip or maybe a mosquito bird to create slight separation interproximally, you know, facial lingual cervical. So, so my preparation, actually, usually an online prep is pretty quick, like about 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. And uh, so after I'm done with my super gingival preparation, then impression is a piece of cake because everything is above the gum. So, you know, use Panacil from, from Kettenbach, which is a very hydrophilic material. Did you Inject say with Panacil. Panosil, P-A-N-O-S-I-L? No, P-N-A-S-I-L, Panacil. Panacil from Kettenbach, which is a, a company that, that sells direct. It's, it's the most hydrophilic impression material in dentistry. Uh, they have a patent, they have, you know, super, super hydrophilic, which means I don't even dry the tooth. I finish prepping and I inject my, my Panacil to that wet surface and it takes the impression because it's super hydrophilic. So super easy to take an impression. When I'm done with the impression, I call my assistant to, to, uh, to make temps. And, and she, well, the way she's going to make the temp is she's going to use that pre-op impression for what use uh, some type of a silicone. I use, usually we use uh, also um, a material from, from Kettenbach called, called silgenate, which is um, uh, a sil uh, an alginate substitute. So, so she will fill the, the tooth with um, Protem or Luxatem or whatever you like, you know, some bisacryl, put it on the tooth, put it on the back in the mouth, let it set halfway, then, 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 the, then take it out. The, the, the only will be, you know, hard, but still a little flexible. So we take it out, then, then clean the excess, put it back in, let it fully polymerize in the tooth. You don't, you don't want to, you don't want to take it out and let it polymerize outside of the tooth because it will, it will shrink and then it won't fit. So, so you take it out, you trim it, put it back in right away. And then, uh, and then, it will be super fast to make provisional like that. And then we cement the provisional with resin cement. That's the key with keeping onlays provisionals because uh, it, they don't have a lot of mechanical retention. If you, if, if, when I finish my preparation, my preparation is fairly flat. It doesn't have a lot of mechanical retention. So it's, it's a little bit like a, it's a little bit like a crown prep without axial reduction, really. It's just an occlusal reduction. So it has no mechanical retention. How is that temporary going to stay? Resin temporary cement. Or temporary cement this, that, that is resin. So, so you put it in uh, and it actually locks into place. That resin sets, shrinks, and locks into place. We rarely use, uh, uh, we rarely, rarely lose provisionals when we use this material. The two resin cements that are most popular, and I think they are best at this particular point, is uh, is one from from Voco called uh, Bifex Temp. B I F I X Bifex Temp from Voco, and then the other one is called. Um, Tembrex from uh, Tembrex TNE from Tembrex, and uh, both are resin cements and they're phenomenal. So very very desirable. And then the day of the cementation, you know, uh, the day of the cementation when everything is super gingival, cementing an onlay is very easy because you don't have bleeding. The gums are not bleeding, so then so then uh, it's easy to do our bonding procedure. So your Twitter, I just uh, retweeted your last Twitter. He's at Ruiz Seminars, R-U-I-Z Seminars. 
Um, I just retweeted your uh, learn 100% successful zirconia cantilever bridge techniques, much more, uh, Dr. Ruiz and Dr. Bertolotti. Um, and so, um, so what material would you use for that onlay? Emacs high translucency. Emacs high translucency because, first of all, Emacs is incredibly strong. But if we want to, if, if I'm keeping the margins above the gum and, and, uh, and basically in the middle of the tooth, the only way that I'm going to get a good blend is if I use a translucent material. Otherwise, you'll see an awful line. So we want, so Emacs with high translucency will, will do very well will give us a pretty good blend that patients will not complain about. So what are my homies going to find if they go to your website, RuizDentalSeminars.com? Uh, well, they're going to find uh, a lot of, you know, wonderful information, lots of videos of, of really cool techniques, uh, tricks of, you know, how to make dentistry easier, faster, better. Uh, uh, they're going to see some, some, um, uh, information about our workshops. We have we have workshops almost twice a month here in the Studio City, and uh, and and these workshops are forty percent hands on or more. Some of them are sixty percent hands on. Where so when we do an onlay workshop, we we you know people prep multiple onlays and cement and build do build ups and enamel preservation and impressions and provisionals. Uh, when we do the veneer workshops, people prep multiple teeth, provisionalize, cement. It's, it's you know, very hands-on, very practical because I'm a practicing clinician. So while I lecture almost somewhere, almost every Friday, uh, I was just lecturing yesterday at USC. Um, I, I practice four days a week and I do a lot of dentistry. So the stuff that we talk about and we teach is practical stuff that the practicing clinicians can do you know i'm a big fan of all these youtube videos on your um ruiz dental and um if you want ryan to add any of these youtube videos after our podcast because we put this on youtube itunes i mean you have you have uh i love your uh your video five rules of super gingival dentistry and then you have um, the SE bonding technique. Um, SE stands for self-etching bonding technique. Um, you have um, impression techniques. You have so many videos. And you have uh, courses, I mean, talk about occlusion and rehab, super gingival veneers and onlays, direct composites, implants. You have a mini residency. I mean, you're, you're an amazing... Uh, person now i want you to put your dad hat on because we're we're over the hour that's our brand we're in overtime but um do you have any children i have three children three children well you're luckier than me i had four so you're tw <laughs> you're 25 percent luckier, luckier than I guess. me <laughs> um right ryan, ryan disagrees um but the, but the um here's what i want you to put on your dad hat let's pretend that one of your three children just walked out of dental school. Because here's, here's what she's saying to me. She said, when I'm in dental school, um, so talk to the senior class right now. Because a lot of the seniors are like, okay, I'm graduating two, three. Uh, and in, at AT still, yeah, uh, last Sunday, uh, one kid was $400,000 in debt already. And uh, they're graduating in May. So this is uh, February 3rd. They're about to graduate in a couple months. And they say, you know, they're all upset because they never got to do an Invisalign case. They never placed an implant. Uh, they're looking at all these. Um, uh, so she's, what she's asking you is, I need to pay out my student loans. Do you think I should go learn Invisalign? Should I go become an implantologist? Um, should, um, what, what do I learn in the marketplace that can help me build a successful practice like you. And by the way, you're, I, I couldn't think of a more competitive place to be in California. I mean, you guys, you're in Los Angeles. How many dental schools do you have within a stone's throw? USC, UCLA, um, Redlands. Uh, Western and Loma Linda. Loma Linda, what was the other one you said? Western. Western, now, now that's the new one, right? Yeah, that's the new one. And then, and then up in San Ramona. Fran, you got um, you got um, U of P and University of California, San Francisco. So you're in a state with six dental schools, and you're in the wrong end. You should have been up north where there's only two dental schools. You're down <laughs> there in L.A. with four dental schools. 
What advice would a you, lot of dentists? Yeah, what advice would you give her? I mean, um, are the glory days over? Can she still start a practice and someday be like you? Or is she going to be stuck at Western Dental the rest of her life? Um, what What would you tell her? What should she learn? Oh. Do demographics matter? Is LA a no go and she's got to go to um, you know some uh, county in Kansas that doesn't have a dentist? What would you tell her? Well, I mean. There's lots. I mean, there's there's lots of different direct things that we could talk about. But um, one of the first things I would say: learn to do the basics very well. And and the basics for a restorative dentist is doing a really good, easy class two, fast, efficient, no sensitivity, no problems. If you, if you can do a nice class two without problems, life becomes really, really easy. That's because that's what we do. That's the bread and butter dentistry. That's like what we do every single day. Be good at it. Because otherwise, every time you have to do a freaking class two, you're going to suffer. So be good at it. You know, learn somewhere. Maybe come to one of our courses at the LA Institute where we make it easy. I mean, everybody, after they, they go through that technique, is like, this is so much better and easier. First, so, you know, um, then of course, you know, learn learn how to you know how to provide your patients with with uh, you know options that are healthier for them. I think that the a wonderful way to differentiate uh, from from you know the thousands of other dentists they are here in Los Angeles is to be able to tell our patients that we do. Uh, restorations are healthier and uh, by you know doing super gingival dentistry that, 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 that doesn't irritate the tissues as much it would preserve a lot more tooth people like that especially in Los Angeles people are very health conscious and they want to look good and they want to stay healthy and and they want they don't want the, the tooth cut into a little peg so so differentiating helps a great deal for for you know for our practices. Um, I think that that of course, like like as you said, people are coming out of dental school with a half a million dollar debt. It's tough. It's very very tough. And, you know, but but um, but after you know learning the basics, good restorative dentistry, which is what we do every day. You know, occlusion, which is what we do every single day. If we don't understand how to adjust correctly the bite, uh, uh, everything that we do is going to have problems. Whether it's a non-lay or even if we actually do a crown, uh, the crown is going to have a problem. The filling is going to have a problem. So understanding the, the bite is crucial for a happy dental life. Um, and then when it's time to do, to, to, you know, after getting a little experience, a couple of years, a few years, you know, there are people, different people vary, being an associate for two, three, four years, whenever. And then at one point, I think everybody should open up their own practice. And, and, and uh, you know, when, when we open our own practice, then we need to make a decision. I don't think that there is one, one place fits all. I mean, some people may prefer to, to be in a neighborhood that, where they have lower fees and, and help a lot of people that, that need and, and um, you know, provide dentistry. It's still, we could still provide super gingival dentistry, but we provide, but, but uh, you know, maybe we use less expensive labs and, and we find ways to provide dentistry that is a little less expensive. And some people may want to go to the expensive neighborhoods and do, you know, use expensive labs and have expensive rent and have you know expensive decoration. So so so. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think that dentists do better when they have their own practices. They will, they they can they can have their own path. They make their own decisions. They do. They're the masters of their their home, their dental home. So I I encourage. I if I had a daughter, and I am fortunate at this point. I I don't think that I'm going to have a a dentist. Uh, you know, son or daughter, but uh, if I did, I would strongly encourage them to to have their own practice and and you know help the community by providing them amazing dentistry. That was that should have been a graduation speech, and I just want to add one more rant onto that. Look, um, if you think that 
um, getting a job as an associate. Remember, everybody always talks about being an associate like Heartland or Aspen or Western Dental or any of those stuff or Pacific Dental. Um, but 80% of associateships are in the private sector. Um, you know, there's 125,000 general dental office buildings. I mean, I mail a dental magazine, Dental Town, to each one of them each month. And when you study associateships, um, the average one only lasts one to two years. So nobody's happy in associate. And, and it's not just dentistry. When you look at FANG, the, the big stock market bubble we're in right now that let out 600 points last Friday, FANG, you know, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Microsoft, um, those, the millennials, the average millennial only stays there one to two years. The average Apple employee millennial quits after a year. Facebook lat holds them the longest at two. And these companies are giving them beanbag chairs and foosball and pool tables and all their snacks and trying to make the coolest procedure there is. But it comes down to anthropology. And anthropology, monkeys don't want to live in a boarding house, they want their own cave, their own car, their own office, and and since you're a homo sapien human being, when you go get a job and somebody starts telling you what to do, you're a monkey. You don't like that. So if all if all the millennials quit after a year or two, get the delusion out of your head that you're going to be a happy little employee for 40 years because the only little happy little employee for 40 years is going to be a droid um r2d2 cp3o i mean it's not going to be a human and you keep telling me when i go in these dental schools they keep telling me that all the dso's had already come in there three or four times to form me all telling them that they have too much debt, there's no way they can start their own practice, and they preach all this fear so that you sign up. But I'm telling you, go back over the last decade. Everyone quits in one to two years. Nobody can keep an associate because you can't get two dentists to agree that today is Saturday. So, uh, and that's another reason I don't like partnerships because when you get married, you have sex, you have children, you live together, celebrate holidays, and it fails half the time. You know what percent of the time the relationship fails when you marry a dentist and there's no sex, no children, no holidays, no evenings and weekends? It always fails. So be true to yourself. And then some girls say to me, well, I think I should get a job as associate because I want to have children. And I don't, I don't want to worry about my office at 5 o'clock. I want to go home and take care of your children. Well, I'll tell you what. You know what a super mom is? A super mom is when your kid falls off the swing set at school and they rush in the emergency room and you own the place and you say, cancel my afternoon. I'm out of here. A super mom is a mom that can sit there and create her own destiny. So um, I'm not a big fan of working for somebody else. I mean, I have only worked for two people in my life. I worked for my dad at Sonic Drive-In from age 10 to 20. And my dad owned a Sonic Drive-In. Do they have those in Hollywood or is it too uh, health conscious out there? <laughs> no, they still have it and I love them. <laughs> yeah, so that's what my dad had. So I worked for my dad from 10 to 20 and then I worked for me. Uh, from 20 to 55. But hey, uh, Jose, I am your biggest fan. I think you are so amazing. Uh, I think what you did today you, was uh, you gave them so many pearls, so many tips. And for you to take an hour out of your life on a Saturday uh, to come on my show was a huge honor. And I um, would love, uh, I always think of Batman and Robin, you and Ray Bertolotti. Uh, if you could uh, get on the horn with Bertolotti and, and, and tell Ray... That we'll, Ryan lives here, so we'll, we'll do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I mean, if he said 3 o'clock in the morning on Tuesday, we're ready. Because it would be a real fun, since you guys wrote a book together, right. it'd be really fun to, uh, you know, we talked about you, your book, and Ray was the editor. And uh, Ray was a, um, he was a big deal. When I got out of school in 87, he was already a legend. I mean, uh, him and yeah. Fuziyama out of Japan... And That's John right. Kanka, I mean, the, those guys were legends when I was, just got out of uh, uh, the neonatal nursery dental school, U UMKC. So, again, Jose, thank you so much for coming on my show. Thank I you. hope the rest of your... My pleasure. And then I'm going to hold you to one last fee. We're going we're gonna to see how smart you are. Predict the winner of the Super Bowl. Oh, my goodness. And they're all going to um, know if you're right or wrong. Uh, I, I think the Patriots are going to win, I unfortunately. Know I know it. 
I always want the underdog. I don't know why that is, but if everybody <laughs> yeah. everybody says the Patriots are going to win, I would like the Eagles to win, but I don't think they will. Do you think there's even a chance? I, there's always a chance, but I think it's a small chance. <laughs> All right. <laughs> on that note, have a rocking hot day. Hey, thank you. Nice talking to you. Nice.